Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Bhutang Tamang Sanghang Namasami. We come to the uh, full moon day of April, and uh, our winter retreat time is formally uh, completed, and the uh, usual routine for the uh, Amravati year is getting underway at this time. Uh, This morning when we had our informal community announcements, uh, one of the comments uh, I was making, uh, if I remember correctly, was uh, if we really want to to live in in Amravati, uh, this means uh, abiding in the deathless realm. So Amravati, the, the, the word Amravati, A means not, Mara means death, Vati is the the uh, the realm or the place the location so the the name of this monastery is uh, amravati means it means the deathless realm but that's just the address uh, we can physically live here uh, have our, our bodies uh, parked on the site in various uh, buildings kutis uh, huts and dwellings that uh, that we have uh, here uh, associated with this monastery but uh, just because we're located at this address doesn't mean to say that we're we're uh, abiding in the deathless. Uh, it uh, takes more than that. You know, the, when we speak of the the deathless realm, this is talking about a, a dimension of our being, a dimension of reality, uh, as uh, the the Buddha described it: the unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed. It's a, a timeless reality, a kaliko. So how do we genuinely live in uh, the uh, the deathless realm? How is that deathlessness uh, embodied or actualized, realized? Now, this is a, a theme of many of Lumpur Sumato's teachings. He, uh, he had to undertake the very worldly uh, task of going, going to the dentist today. <laughs> Uh, very much the conditioned, formed, created uh, realm. So uh, he wasn't uh, able to offer a Dhamma teaching this afternoon. That's why we're having a Dhamma talk in the evening, this particular moon day. The um, the, uh, frequent theme of Lumpur's uh, teachings in recent times has been this realization of of deathlessness, or the, the timeless quality, the unimaginable, uh, intangible, ephemeral quality of, of Dhamma, that is the, the realization, the embodiment, the actualization of that quality being the, the purpose of our lives, our practice. We're, we come together in order to, to know the Dhamma, to realize the Dhamma, to practice the Dhamma, to, to be, uh, to embody and to be Dhamma. So uh, if we really want to live in Amravati, we really want to abide here, then it's not just a matter of, of physically inhabiting the, the place, but uh, realizing that quality, awakening to that quality of the heart, of, uh, of our being, of, of reality. But during the winter retreat time, I was giving uh, readings most days from uh, Lumpur Cha's, uh, a collection of Lumpur Cha's teachings with the title Being Dharma, uh, a collection of talks translated by Paul Breiter, and uh, read much of that book to the community, and it was very delightful to be able to uh, reflect you know, deeply and closely daily on those themes of Lumpur Cha's teachings. And one of the, the points that uh, came up uh, repeatedly uh, is how the mind creates the world of things. We, we determine things into existence. And 
uh, in our ordinary everyday uh, say, way of speaking, way of thinking, way of seeing that we, uh, we, uh, we uh, over and over again affirm the realm of things. So, yeah, I am a person, this is a chair, this is a building. Uh, this is Amravati, it's a place, <laughs> it's a Buddhist monastery in Hertfordshire. That's what this is. So we, uh, we keep reaffirming the world of things, and, and uh, over and over again, in, in many and various ways, uh, Lumpur Cha would point out that, that there isn't really anything there. <laughs> we keep determining things into existence because they're not really there. Uh, that uh, certainly there's the experience of, you know, solid form uh, and of a chair, of a, of a building, of a, of a body, of a, you know, the sound of a voice, the words that, that are formed. Yes, there are these perceptions, but turning them into separate independent things, that is something that our mind is continually doing through the conditioning of our birth, uh, the instinctual habits of our our life in the, in the animal realm with a physical body that needs to breathe and eat and subject to the laws of, of gravity and uh, birth and death. So uh, one of the, the, the themes I found myself reflecting on a lot during this winter is that yeah, there isn't really any real thing. We talk, we use a, that kind of phrase in English that it's, it's the real thing. But if we take Lumpo Cha's teachings to heart, the Buddha and the Buddha's teachings to heart, what they tell us is that there isn't any real thing. <laughs> if it's a thing, it's not real. Uh, so to say, building or chair or person, it's a, a convenient way of expressing ourselves. But what's I would say actually uh, present, say with this the the temple here, it's a, a fluid process of elements that are uh, are in a process of change. In this particular form and structure, we say building. And this, this, this temple is designed to last for a thousand years. So uh, hopefully <laughs> this form will hold itself together for a, a goodly length of time. But it is a fluid process. Like the, these limestone tiles that, that form the, the floor, these were little uh, sh uh, crustaceans, little uh, shell shell-wearing creatures uh, swimming around in various seas and waters millions and millions of years ago, and they died and their shells became limestone. And then they were uh, gathered uh, f uh, together in a quarry and then dug up and, f and formed into neat square shapes with a polished surface, and they're, they're here. But these were little shell shellfish uh, were swimming around in an ocean millions of years ago. These, these pillars and beams, these were oak trees that were acorns one day. It's not just fanciful, you know, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, tamat, this dhamma seat I'm sitting on, the, the, this came from acorns, little, <laughs> little seeds that landed in the ground and grew up as oak trees and then formed it into these fine shapes. And then the, the oak trees were, were cropped, were cut down, formed into these round and rectangular shapes and then carted here on lorries and put together by the, the building crew, the, the green oak people and uh, according to the design of the architect and here they are and put all these together with the bricks and the tiles and the other bits and pieces and the lights and the and the buddha image and the shrine and we call it temple <laughs> but it is uh, in itself it's a it's a fluid process it's a fluid collection of elements that have come together in this particular form at this particular moment from our, our human scale of things you know a thousand years is a long time but if you compare it to how long ago these little creatures that make up the tiles of the floor, millions and millions of years ago, a thousand years is just a finger snap. It's not, not very long at all. So, so uh, I feel that I found that's a very helpful reflection to say if to support that sense of embodying the the quality of the timeless reality, the akaliko dhamma that timeless, unborn, unconditioned, unformed, non-personal quality of, of the truth, of reality, to, to bring that kind of recollection to mind, that there isn't any real thing, that any way of talking about a person, our names, uh, 
our uh, identi- our family stories, our role as Buddhists or monastics or lay people as women or men. These are just convenient ways of speaking, convenient fictions for the purpose of of communicating and functioning in our living world. But there isn't really anything there. <laughs> and just to, to genuinely take that to heart and to feel the result of that, to, to genuinely uh, recognize the change of heart that comes with that, that, oh, there isn't really anything here. <laughs> There's no real thing. When we say the real thing, that can only be a prox- an approximation, just a, a, a way of speaking, a, a, a conventional form that we use, like saying England or Britain or United Kingdom or Europe or, or Amravati or Theravada Buddhism, a human being, person, uh, Ajahn Amro. Uh, the, uh, these are all just names, conventions, forms that we use out of, uh, out of convenience just to... Uh, and function effectively in the world, but the problems come when we take them to be absolutely solid and real and permanent and true things, uh, real, separate, independent things. Oh, the, the chant that we did this evening, um, most people who are gathered here are probably familiar. This is the, the, uh, the Anatta Lakana Sutta, the discourse on not self. This is uh, traditionally, the uh, second discourse that the, the Lord Buddha gave to his five companions uh, just after his enlightenment, he journeyed from Bodhgaya to Varanasi, to the deer park uh, outside of uh, Varanasi, uh, it was called Saranath, and met up with his five uh, companions, people, uh, that the uh, group of, of other meditators, yogis that he'd lived the ascetic life together with. And uh, he went to, to, to meet them and to, to share his understanding. Uh, at first, they were not very welcoming to him. They thought he was uh, one who has given up on the ascetic life. He'd taken to eating ordinary amounts of food and seemed to have gone against their uh, ethic of sort of self-torture and, star- and starvation and, uh, and, and uh, extreme asceticism. Uh, but then they were so impressed by his demeanor, his peacefulness, his radiance and his his presence, that they, they couldn't stop themselves from paying respects and, and inviting him to, to, to uh, share his understanding with them, eventually. <laughs> now, the first talk that he gave them was the teaching on the middle way and the Four Noble Truths, which is known as the, the setting in motion of the wheel of Dhamma, Dhamma Chakra Pavatana Sutta. And then the second discourse, um, this is uh, traditionally known to be this one we recited this evening there, discourse on not self the anatalakana sutta during that first discourse uh, uh, one of, of his five companions uh, reached the first level of enlightenment uh, he realized stream entry uh, and uh, understood what the buddha was saying and this insight this uh, comprehension this clarity dawned within him um, but the other four it's not said that they, they didn't uh, it's not said that they understood so profoundly or so completely at that time but they had faith in what he had to say and were impressed by his presence, his teaching. And so later on, uh, some time later, then he gave this the second teaching. And uh, the completion of this, uh, at the end of the sutta, if you read the translation, it describes how all five of them became fully enlightened at the, uh, at the completion of, of the Anathalakana Sutta. So that was the very uh, profound impact that, that that had. But in this sutta, the Buddha goes about uh, this say uh, uh, explaining and um, uh, walking them through this means of reshaping the vision of this body and this mind uh, to see it in a different way to see things uh, say from a perspective of Dhamma rather than from the habitual ways of seeing and thinking so uh, he uh, in the the teaching is based around what we call the five khandas, the five groups or the five divisions of, of body and mind. So the first one, rupa, literally means material form or the body. So that's the uh, re- representing the physical world, this body and the material world around us. Everything from buildings and the, the, the ground we, we walk on, the, the, you know, the trees and the sky, the stars and planets and uh, all of the, 
the physical world is rupa, rupa kanda, the world of material form. And then the other four, vedana, sannyas, and kara vijnana, uh, those are representing the mental, uh, re the mental dimension of our being. So vedana is sensation or feeling, sanya perception, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching. Sankara represents uh, thinking and emotion, memory, uh, intention, intentionality, mental activity. And then uh, vijnana literally means a sense consciousness or discriminative consciousness, that basic level of cognition which, which discerns or, or can discriminate one thing from another, a basic uh, quality of of cognition, or you can think of it as the, the building blocks of experience, just in terms of our neurophysiology, the firing of the, of the neurons in our brain that uh, create a thought or a visual form or a, a sound or a smell or a taste or a touch, the individual uh, sparking of neurons that form those uh, impressions of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking. So basically, uh, the five khandas represent body and mind, uh, the, the mental realm and the physical realm. And the Buddha walks the, uh, the five companions uh, through the, uh, the, this, uh, these qualities, these aspects of body and mind to help them explore and to, to see them differently. And uh, it revolves around this principle of, uh, of, in a sense, the question of what are we? Yeah, what, uh, what is the self? So then he first of all takes the rupa, the body, and says, "Is the, is rupa uh, in a state of change, or is it not in a state of change?" Nichangwa and nichangwati. Is uh, is it permanent or is it impermanent? And they say, "Well, it's in a it's in a state of change. Uh, it, it's um, it's uh, anichang pante." And then he says, "Okay, so that which is in a state of change." Uh, can that be permanently satisfying? Dukangwa, uh, sukangwati, dukangwati. Is it sukha or dukkha? Is it something subject to affliction or not subject to affliction? Is it totally satisfying or not totally satisfying? And they say, well, you know, um, because it's in a state of change, then uh, it can't be permanently satisfying. It, it is subject to affliction. It, it can't be uh, pleasing, satisfying all the time. Then he says, so, if something is in a state of change and is uh, subject to affliction, is it appropriate, is it worthy, uh, is it suitable to say of that, that this is mine, this is what I am, this is myself. Etang mama eso hamasmi eso me ata. And to which they reply, you know, no he tang bante. No, it's not. <laughs> because the, uh, within their philosophical landscape of that time, the Atta, or the Atman in Sanskrit, was considered to be, you know, the, the, the true self, quote-unquote, is something that was perm is permanent and blissful and stable. So um, in that analysis, the Buddha walking them through is saying, well, if, if the body is, in a, is unsatisfactory, is in a state of change and, and, can't, and is subject to affliction, then it can't be, that can't be the Atta, the Atman, it can't be something that is is uh, blissful and permanent. It, it's not reliable. Uh, it's not uh, something to, that we can genuinely call who and what we are. It's uh, not not self. It's anatta. And then with the other four factors, he walks them through in the same way, with the world of sensation, pleasant feeling, painful feeling, neutral feeling, the world of perception, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, the world of sankara, volition, uh, memory, uh, imagination, thoughts, emotions, and and uh, consciousness, sense consciousness itself. So, uh, to each of these, he leads them through, and then they arrive at the, the conclusion that you know, none of these is uh, who and what we are. None of these are atta. They are all anatta. They're not self. So this is a, a lot of Pali in, in a chant like that. Um, but the reason why we recite these words, we memorize them and, and learn them and investigate them, is because they are extremely useful tools. <laughs> to help us to genuinely embody that, that deathless quality, to discover that deathless ayatana, that, that deathless, unborn, unconditioned, undying uh, sphere of being with, that is part of our nature, that's an attribute of our nature that we keep missing because of the attention being caught by the born, the dying, the originated, the formed, 
and the personal. So that this format of the, the five khandhas, the five groups, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, sense consciousness, that's a, a handy way of looking at this life, what we take to be this person, who I am, this woman, this man, old, young, the, our nationality is, is um, British or Thai or Sri Lankan or Hungarian or American, French, German, whatever we might uh, uh, have on our passport or our passports. <laughs> the uh, Ajahn Vajiro is Malaysian. Most people don't know that. <laughs> Even though he sounds very English, he's a, he's a, uh, he speaks good Malaysian as well. So. So whatever happens to be on our, our passport, our nationality, and so forth, we we uh, we can look at these attributes of who and what we think we are, and challenge that, you know, uh, to explore that, to to see uh, is that is there something really there? Is there a real thing here <laughs> in what I call this person, or is it just a collection of parts that kind of, that are put together like a like a the the oak um, panels of this dhamma seat? There were a number of oak trees growing in some forest somewhere, and they put together, and we call it chair. So we put the elements of our uh, the earth, water, fire, and wind uh, that make up these bodies. We put them together and say person. So the more that we look and apply these tools of the reflection on the five khandhas, uh, our body, our feelings, perceptions, uh, our thoughts and emotions, you really use this as a set of tools to explore person personating not not impersonating but personating <laughs> if such a word actually exists well it does now so <laughs> so that that personating habit of the mind to explore that and to challenge it to 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 really look at the way that the mind keeps creating uh, the the habits of self view uh, earlier this morning uh, uh, just after the monks recitation on the full moon day and new moon day we recite our our precepts and Lumpur Sumedho kindly offered a few reflections to the uh, the monks community this morning and one of the things that he said was that the that self-view is sustained by us believing in our thoughts that they say the sankara kanda that the, the that uh, that group of mental activities of thinking by believing thoughts to be true and real, we, the, the mind keeps sustaining the sense of I, I, I am talking, I am hearing, I am feeling, I am comfortable, I am uncomfortable, uh, I am thirsty, uh, I am sleepy, uh, yeah, I am uh, this person, I am Ajahn Amaro, I, uh, yeah, I am this or that, this is me, this is mine, this is myself. It's because of believing in our thinking uh, well, not big, well, one of the contributing factors is because of believing in those sorts, those habitual ways of naming things, labeling things, taking what is, uh, in in essence, a convenient fiction, taking it to be true. I, I am Ajahn Amaro. To my sisters, I was with them on Monday, I'm not Ajahn Amaro, I'm their little brother. <laughs> but, uh, I, I am not their teacher. <laughs> I'm not their abbot. That's not the way I sit in their world. So if I'm sitting in my, if I'm in my sister's living room, uh, then in one, on one level I'm the same person, but from their perception I'm I'm not the abbot of Amravati. I'm I'm their little brother, and that's why we're together as these human three human beings in a room because of all being born from the same parents and having this close physical relationship. So, in terms of using this this teaching of the uh, Anatta Lakana Sutta and the investigation, looking uh, at those patterns of thinking is extraordinarily important. How the mind keeps creating this person from believing in these thoughts: I am feeling, I am hearing, I am understanding, I am not understanding. All those I am's, all those me's and mine's. It takes a lot of mindfulness, a lot of care and attention to keep catching them, <laughs> moment by moment, day after day, hour after hour. You know, all those I thinks, I feels, I'm going, you know, I've got, I haven't got, I want, I don't want. Uh, all those I am's, I have's, uh, I should, I shouldn't. They're, they're, they're all 
patterns of thinking, they're all convenient fictions. So if there's sufficient mindfulness, then that, that mindfulness can, can catch those, notice them, and, and question them, question those, those assumptions that uh, come with that. You know, is this, is this me? You know, uh, is, this, uh, is this mine? Is this what I am? Is this myself? Etang mama eso hamasmi eso me ata. No, hey, Tang Bante. No, it's not. <laughs> no, they're not. So, along with uh, thoughts, patterns of thinking, then also our feelings, our emotions, uh, and um, judgments, uh, the, the conventions that we live with. There's many, many areas where we, the mind keeps creating self and other, me and the world, that uh, self view. Uh, gets fueled, gets supported, gets reified, gets made apparently real by believing in uh, our uh, emotions. Uh, the uh, when we're when we're joyful and happy, like yeah, this is great. Do we challenge that, or do we just go, this is great? No, it, it is great. <laughs> I love this. Do we challenge that, or do we do we recognize this is the mind, the mind saying this is great? This is the, this is great feeling. That's what this is. Uh, when we feel the opposite, oh, this is awful. Oh, when's this going to be over? Oh, I can't stand it. What does she think she's doing? <sighs> do we challenge that? Do we, do we believe uh, in that kind of uh, judgment? You know, what, is he, what is he up to? Why does he think that's appropriate? Do we notice that? Or do we believe in the, why does, why does she do it that way? This is the, why does she do it that way, feeling, or why does he think that's appropriate, feeling? <laughs> or do we believe our judgments as being something absolutely true and real and reliable? Uh, when we look, you know, look at our own, uh, our own actions, you know, oh, uh, and when we feel we, we've done something that is... Uh, hasn't worked well. Oh, I'm a bit of a failure. That no, it really didn't work. <laughs> I'm such an idiot. I can't. I can't do these things very well. I'm, I'm really not very good at this. That might seem to be an ordinary, everyday, practical and realistic assessment. But exactly in, in exactly the same way, do we challenge that? Here is the mind saying, "I'm not very good at this." That's what this feeling is. Uh, that's that the feeling of not being very good at something. It's like this, <laughs> or the, the opposite. Uh, I'm I'm really pretty good at this. You know, that that turned out really great. Yes, yes. You know, I've, I've done well there. That's a that, that that's a real success. Do we challenge that and explore that? This is the uh, uh, I'm a real I'm really good at this feeling. It might seem like it's a kind of a clinical way of sort of sterilizing our emotions, but uh, I would say it's, it's not a matter of sterilizing them, it's a matter of not getting drunk on them, <laughs> uh, not just believing in their content, but recognizing this is the feeling of liking, this is the feeling of disliking, this is the feeling of, of succeeding, this is the feeling of failing, this is the feeling of getting, this is the feeling of losing, that's what these are. You're not pretending anything, you're not suppressing anything, that the, you're allowing the wisdom faculty of the heart to see and, and know things as they are. <laughs> yeah, and so it might feel like when you have that, yes, this is great, to to then sort of take a step back and and to reflect on that to say, this is the this is great feeling. Something can go, oh, that's a bit of deflating. That's a bit disappointing. <laughs> But you were enjoying the thrill of being excited or inspired or gladdened by that. To step back and reflect on that, you, uh, you might feel it's a bit uh, deflating. But um, uh, I would say it's worthwhile exploring that. What well, what feels deflated? <laughs> what what's what's inaccurate about the mind's assessment or appreciation of that that feeling? What uh, is there anything uh, that's not true or not real, not accurate about? This is a feeling. And so also look at the relief that comes when if there's some kind of upset or angry or self-critical feeling. Like, oh, why does he do that? That's so annoying. Oh, this is the, why does he do that? That's so annoying feeling. Oh, 
Notice the relief and the spaciousness that comes with that. So that it's a, there's a balancing, there's a, 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 a clarifying and a, an integrating, balancing quality that comes with this kind of reflection. If we don't train the mind to reflect on, on thoughts and emotions in this way, then we're never going to live at Amravati. <laughs> we're never going to embody the, that deathless quality. We'll always be in the, the Maravati, the, the realm of birth and death, of attaching to gaining and losing, succeeding and failing, uh, comfort and discomfort, uh, happiness and unhappiness. That's the, the Mar Maravati. <laughs> Mara, uh, the uh, the Maravati Buddhist monastery that uh, it's unfortunately very easy to live in <laughs> but if we want to live a genuinely embody the Amravati the, the deathless realm then we need to train the heart to not get drunk on praise and criticism gain and loss success and failure comfort and discomfort yeah another dimension that is it's good to explore uh, and to to reflect upon again which uh, Lumpur, in Lumpur Cha's teachings comes up very very often and similarly Lumpur Sumato is the the way we relate to the conventions of our life so that uh, we have our structure of things the robes that we wear as Buddhist monastics the the way we sit in the temple you know the men on this side the women on that side a gap in the middle you know, we have we have our Pali chanting, and we chant in you know, the words that are pronounced like this, and then we follow the lunar calendar, and so we decide to have our, our observance days on, on these days according to the calendar. You know, many and various uh, customs and rituals and forms that, that we use, and every society uh, has those. That uh, you know the way the way that you do things, the clothes that we wear, you know what's appropriate. For your for the workplace or for you know, a meeting or for a family get, get together for a wedding for a funeral, you know what what do you wear? What's uh, the uh, what, what's the right thing? You know, if if I showed up here uh, for the um, for the evening, I don't know if I'd even be able to do it. But if I rolled my robe and put it over my right shoulder instead of over my left shoulder, and had my robes on the the wrong shoulder. The, probably the people who saw that think there's something weird about Ajahn Amro's robes. What's, what? There's something wrong. Oh, he's got them back to front. But you know, in 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 its essence, what is back to front? It's just well, these just pieces of cloth in a human body. <laughs> According to the conventions of, of Buddhism, we have the the right shoulder uncovered and the left shoulder covered, but. Who says that's the way it's got to be? I'm sure there's some human communities where the it's the right shoulder that's covered and the left one that's uncovered, and that's what's right for them. So to reflect upon our conventions, again, these these can only be convenient fictions, that there isn't anything there. <laughs> these are all human agreements as to how our robes should be sewn, how, should, how they should be worn, what color they should be, our status, uh, all of these things; these are these are only human agreements. Uh, and again, Lumpur Cha is, uh, is uh, very, very uh, uh, wonderfully clear, uh, extraordinarily lucid and clear, repeatedly <laughs> on these uh, on these points. So there isn't really anything there. <laughs> these are just determined into existence. What we call right according to our customs and our our, our habits. We call this right, but from its own side, you know, these are just pieces of cloth. This is just a uh, a set of of human uh, the uh, ways of acting and speaking. We we say it's the it's the observance day. We gather together at seven thirty. You know, we chant the Anatta Lakana Sutta, <laughs> and uh, this is what we do on on this particular day uh, to reflect. Well. This has its value. It has its its meaning, and uh, it's a skillful it's a skillful means in order to help us to uh, focus our minds, train our minds in what is uh, beneficial and liberating. But uh, in itself, it's just a collection of of noises, movements, um, earth, water, fire, and wind. <laughs> from from its own side, uh, you know, this is not a chair. From from the from its own side, these are not robes. These are just 
uh, earth element, earth, water, fire, and wind uh, put together, and we call it Sangati. This is a, a new G1 robe Ajahn Conrad sewed for me before he took off for Norway uh, yesterday. So, but this is a Chivara. We give it that name, Chivara. In English, that doesn't, that, that doesn't mean anything. In Pali, it means rope. So just, uh, I could go on endlessly, as you know, <laughs> but uh, to to notice the many and various conventions that we live with and how we label things, this is appropriate, this is not appropriate, this is, uh, this is what we do, this is what we don't do, this is how we do it, this is how we don't do it. And yes, the, the conventions have a value and, and they... Uh, using the, the forms and structures, the precepts that we have, they have value and purpose, but they are all human agreements. <laughs> There's, there isn't really anything there. And and so sometimes the Lumpur Sumedho or Lumpur Cha would say something like, there isn't really, a, there's, no, there's no such thing really as Buddhism, or Theravada Buddhism doesn't really exist. And... Uh, you could tell the, this sort of feeling, this ripple going through the, the assembly, like, what? <laughs> what does he mean? <laughs> yeah. Theravada, Theravada Buddhism doesn't exist. What are we doing here? Or, how come he's dressed like a Theravada monk if Theravada Buddhism doesn't exist? But what the, these great, uh, great teachers are saying, uh, and what I feel is so valuable uh, in bringing to mind is like the five khandas are empty. They really are empty. There isn't anything there. Uh, we determine their substantiality of the body, of feelings, perceptions, the material world, the conventions. The, uh, we determine these into existence. We give them value and meaning. If we don't give it value and meaning or a name, it doesn't have a name. It doesn't have value or meaning. So uh, that shift from our conditioning of our worldly perspective to the Dhamma perspective, genuinely uh, embodying Dhamma, being Dhamma, seeing things with the eye of Dhamma, then that empty nature of the five khandhas is what is known, is what is appreciated. And when the, the empty nature of the body and mind, the rupa vedana sanya sankara vinyana when the empty nature of the five khandhas is recognized, the result is a great spaciousness, a great ease, a great freedom of heart. That those, uh, those five aggregates, those five groups, those five bundles of fuel, they're called the upadana khandhas. Uh, upadana means not just clinging, but also it means f uh, f uh, f uh, uh, like a fuel for a fire. So the, the five bundles of fuel, we don't need to carry them around like a kind of uncomfortable burden. We can, the heart is able to put them down. Uh, another of the things that uh, Lumpur Sumedho said this morning that was very, very impactful was that uh, 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 as he was giving these reflections after the recitation, he said, so when it's all gone, what remains? <laughs> And then he answered his own question, awareness, that's what remains. That's when the solidity of the five khandhas is, is all gone, when that empty nature has been recognized and seen in, in a clear and complete way, then what remains is awareness. This knowing a quality of the heart, that's, that's uh, you can't really call it a thing, <laughs> a, a quality uh, that... Uh, that is what's genuine, that's what's, what's uh, real and reliable, that's, that's what remains, even though the word remaining isn't uh, quite right, because it's, it's kind of a time-bound, it implies a time-bound quality, but it's what's present. When uh, the five khandhas, uh, the empty nature of the five khandhas is seen through, is recognized, realized, what is present is awareness, is knowing. And when we speak about taking refuge in the Buddha, that's what the, the Buddha is. Uh, the, the Buddha quality, that is uh, the embodiment of awareness. That, uh, that's what the Buddha means, uh, that which is awake, that which is aware. Uh, I often quote uh, the, the sutta where the Buddha has a, 
a dialogue where a Brahmin had seen the, the, the Buddha's footprints in the dust of the road and saw these, uh, these um, beautifully formed patterns made by the lines on the feet of somebody or some being in the dust on the pathway on the road. And this Brahmin called Dona thought, wow, what kind of a being made these footprints or these these uh, these uh, wheel shapes, perfectly round wheel shapes with all these spokes and like a conch shell and these auspicious signs pressed into the ground through the, the marks on some, some being's feet. And he follows the footprints into the forest and finds the Buddha sitting under a tree and he's just awed by the power and peacefulness, this radiant, still, silent being sitting meditating under a tree. So Dona sort of kneels down before uh, the Buddha and says, "Excuse me, but um, uh, are you uh, are you a, a god? Are you a deva?" And then the Buddha says, "No, I'm, I'm not a deva. Well, are you a Brahma god? No, I'm not a Brahma god. Are you a yaka, a celestial demon? No, not a yaka." Then he says, "Are you a human being?" And the Buddha says, "No." So that, where, or literally, the, the 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 full wording is something like um, that, whereby I could be known to be a human being has been abandoned, has been cut off, and brought to uh, been let go of completely. And so then, Dona, having run out of list of possibilities, says, "Well, <laughs> excuse me, but what, what are you?" <laughs> and then the um, the the Buddha's response is, "Budhoti mang dareta, you can know me as that which is awake." You can hold me as that which is uh, awake, Budhoti Mangdareta. So that's, uh, and my understanding is that one of the reasons why we use the word Buddha to refer to the great being who is our teacher and the founder of this religious tradition is because of that dialogue and, and similar dialogues. But that's what we can say, Budhoti, <laughs> that, uh, that which is awake. Yeah. Uh, so, let, having let go of all personhood, what remains is wakefulness, uh, awareness. So, when we hear words like this, uh, we can say, well, what remains, when, when the five khandas are seen as empty, then what remains is awareness. We can take that, an idea or principle like that, and, and mishandle it or think, okay, that just means that as long as we are awake, as long as we are aware, as long as there's mindfulness, then whatever we feel inclined to do or say, then that, that's, that's good. <laughs> All we have to do is be awake, be aware of, of and follow our impulses and interests and, and uh, uh, our inclinations uh, as they arise. But uh, I feel it's very important to recognize that the, the legacy of the Buddha, that the legacy of awakenedness, is not just that uh, the, the Dhamma of ultimate reality, or it's not just that knowing quality, um, but when that the legacy of that embodiment of that knowing quality is Dhamma Vinaya, it's not just uh, the uh, ultimate reality, but its partner is Vinaya. Is uh, that's the, the legacy of, of uh, the Buddha is both that uh, the Dhamma principle of timelessness, unborn, unoriginated, uncreated, unformed, but there's also the vinaya, the, the guidance for conduct, what to say, how to speak, how to act. And so sometimes uh, uh, when people hear teachings or read teachings uh, on a, this very kind of uh, high and inspiring level and just talking about ultimate reality, the mind can say, well, that's all that matters. You know, it's just be awake to the ultimate truth and all the rest is gravy. <laughs> just a, is a, it, literally immaterial, <laughs> then you don't have to think about it. But uh, I, I feel it's extremely important and one of the, the key uh, characteristics or qualities of the forest tradition is that the, the legacy of the Buddha is Dhamma Vinaya, it's, it's the two together, they're, they're two sides of the same reality. It's not just Dhamma on its own, but Dhamma Vinaya. And that, uh, there was also, uh, it was uh, a... Um, uh, I feel it was, it was in a um, bhikkhu someone near a business meeting a, a day or so ago. Uh, no, yesterday, yesterday evening. Actually, Ajahn Nandio said something very, I thought was very, very wise and astute, which was um, that uh, Dhamma meets Vinaya in Sampajanya. If I can quote you. 
I thought it was a very neat and, and uh, wise way of phrasing things. Sampajanya means like a comprehensive awareness. So Dhamma meets Vinaya in Sampajanya, in that attention to the time, the place, the situation, attuning to whether it's time to say something or time to be quiet, time to be vigorous, time to be still, uh, time to take action, time to, to leave things alone. Um, so that uh, I thought was a very skillful way uh, of phrasing things. So I, I noted that down, literally. <laughs> yeah. Dhamma meets Vinaya in Sampajanya, in that comprehensive awareness, or, or as Lumpur Sumedho would uh, translate Sati Sampajanya as uh, intuitive awareness. So that uh, if we want to embody that uh, quality of deathlessness and uh, that seeing the empty nature of the five khandhas, it doesn't mean that we dismiss the world of material form and the body and the conventions of our life, but rather we, uh, we take care of every detail, uh, uh, but with an attitude of non-identification, non-grasping, uh, sort of non-attachment. So that uh, the the legacy of the Buddha is Dhamma Vinaya, and so that uh, in order to say uh, fulfill the potential that, that, that we have, and and if we really want to say uh, embody that that quality of freedom of heart, that, that realization of deathlessness, then that doesn't manifest as ignoring the material world or ignoring our, 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 our personal hygiene or <laughs> eating or sleeping or, or getting along with other people, but it, it, quite the opposite. It means pay attention, tidy your room, wash your robes, your clothes, you know, show up for the meeting on time, you know, volunteer for the washing up, <laughs> look out for your friends, look out for your those who are not your friends, you know, to... Uh, be paying attention to every single uh, every single detail, uh, following the the, uh, the the agreements of the uh, of the community that you're a part of, the precepts that we have, the routines. Paying attention, carefully looking after the the possessions that you have, the duties that have got your name on. Um, being scrupulous and and careful with the five khandhas. <laughs> Uh, not through obsessiveness or, or uh, attachment or, or uh, from an anxious place, but as a natural, uh, say, response, as a, a, that, that very fine phrase, that Dhamma meets Vinaya in Sampajanya, that, that when there is that attunement, that intuitive wisdom is actualized, then that um, quality of the Dhamma, it uh, takes shape. It is embodied in caring for the people that we live with, caring for our own physical well-being, learning to be quiet, learning to be modest, learning to be one of few needs, looking after your living space, washing your teacups, <laughs> putting things away, <laughs> cleaning up after yourself, cleaning up after other people too. But, uh, all of those those details. And again, this comes across over and over again in in Lumpur Cha's teachings, he spells that out in in great detail, and uh, was and in the years that he was running uh, Wat Bapong Monastery, he would from time to time he would speak, uh, he would talk uh, in terms of these very um, say uh, transcendent dhammas, but he would also uh, spend a great deal of time teaching you how how to wear your robes, how not to wear your robes, how to carry your shoulder bag, how not to carry your shoulder bag. He very famously once told Ajahn Vajiro, uh, Ajahn Sumedha will teach you uh, how to reach Nibbana, I'll teach you how to wash your bowl. That's accurate. <laughs> how to look after your bowl. So, so that uh, that, uh, that kind of care and attention for the material world, it's not doesn't contradict uh, those principles of the unborn, undying, unoriginated, uncreated, unformedness, but rather it's uh, when the, those are, say, um, actualized with the right attitude, with a skillful attitude, when there's coming from a place of a, a, attunement, the time, the place, the situation, then the Dhamma and Vinaya, the legacy of the Buddha, is being, uh, say, 
uh, put to its its best use, that, that the full legacy is being uh, being put to use. There's also the uh, the biography of Lumpo Chara is called Stillness Flowing, and uh, that represents the same kind of mixture of the quality of stillness, timelessness, and pre uh, and presence is there together with the flow of perceptions and activity. So in this way, you know, Ajahn Chah would, uh, would talk about you know, the nature of mind is, has these attributes. Yes, there is the quality of stillness and transcendent wisdom, and peacefulness uh, that comes from that realization of the unborn timeless quality. But their perceptions and thoughts and actions and words, they flow. And those two don't interfere with each other. So in a way, you can consider that stillness flowing is just another way of saying Dhamma Vinaya, that those, bringing those two qualities together, how they work together. And they can seem contradictory. Say, so, well, if I'm paying attention to every detail, tidying my room and washing my teacups and volunteering for the doing the dishes, you know, how can I be realizing the deathless at the same time? You know, yeah, which should I do? You know, which is the right? But uh, again, as Lumpur Chav uh, famously, he's famous, famously within our community, um, once uh, said to the young Ajahn Sumedho when he was uh, a fairly new bhikkhu training with Ajahn Chah, uh, apparently Lumpur said to him one day, Sumedho, you must be confused. And so he wasn't quite sure where this was going to go, but he said, about what Lumpur? I said, well, the Dhamma is all about letting go, but the Vinaya is all about holding on. And so then he he took that in and said, yes, actually, that is quite confusing. <laughs> now you come to mention it. And uh, as Lumpur Sumedha describes that that uh, exchange, he, th he kind of thought that uh, Lumpur Chah was then going to go into a long discourse explaining how it all, uh, the, the how these qualities all uh, worked together and, and uh, interrelated. But uh, he just said very briefly, uh, when you figure out how they work together, you'll be fine. So that was it. <laughs> End of Dhamma talk. So the Dhamma is all about letting go. The Vinaya is all about holding on. When you figure out how they work together, you'll be fine. So I offer these thoughts for consideration this evening.